think we're ready to start. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Prescott from The Times, and I'm delighted to welcome this afternoon our international keynote speaker, Mike Fries, Chief Executive of Liberty Global and the Vice Chair. Yeah. There's quite a lot to wrap your head. Okay. <laughs> when we talk about Liberty Global, there's quite a lot uh, to wrap your head around, I think. Yeah. Um, over the past 30 years, since being its fifth employee, Mike's built up the business to be a leader in broadband, video, and mobile, as well as infrastructure and content. And um, obviously, Liberty is global, but I'd like to start with your UK operations, where just sure. to make sure I get everything right, you've got half of Virgin Media 02. Correct. All three media, half of all three media. Correct. 10% stake in ITV and a 5% stake in Vodafone. Plus 35% uh, in Formula E. Of course. Yeah. Well done, you got them, almost right. got them. <laughs> Try them down. But it's interesting, you personally have just decided to move to the UK in, in the last few weeks. This is right, correct, yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> not that, she sounds know, surprised. Not that living in, in Holland Park. <laughs> well, it's, it's the weather, obviously. <laughs> Uh, although I, I'm sure I brought three weeks of sunshine from Colorado because it's been beautiful up until a couple of days ago. Um, well, as you noted, we've been doing this for 30 years. I've been living on an airplane pretty much that entire time. We've invested in 50 countries around the world. But Europe has always been one of our biggest markets. Um, and we've been in as many as 20 countries in Europe. And of course, recently we scaled that back and really doubled down on mobile and, and national scale. And the UK is, you know, for sure, our biggest and most important market. Um, so it seemed like the right time. I've got four of my core reports here uh, in the office. We've had an office here for 25 years. And to be honest, it's a great time for my family. Uh, I lived abroad once before with my two older daughters. I have my three and a half year old son and my wife. And it has been a seamless transition, uh, except for the driving, I have to be honest. Um, my wife would not drive with me on the other side of the road until one morning when we didn't have anyone to take him to school and I had to drive and it worked. Now, now she's over the hump. But uh, other than that, it's, it's been really great and it's, it's nice to be here. And is it an indication of how important the UK is to the business? Yes, for sure, yeah. Let's talk about one of the, one of the companies here. I'm sure people will be interested to, to know what, what the future holds for it and all three media. Okay, yeah. You've put it up for sale. Uh huh. Um, why have you done that? Is, that? is that an indication that Liberty is sort of prioritizing distribution over content? Not necessarily, and I don't want to make Jane Turton blush, but I will, because this is, yeah, exactly. This is actually, L3 is an incredible business. Um, you all know the story, you know, 50 wonderful studios, a billion of revenue, and pretty much doubled that since we've, we've been investors. Um, and it has, you know, hundreds of awards, it's done an incredible job, uh, but the industry is changing, and studios are searching for scale especially pure play studios like all three media. So Warner Brothers Discovery, our partner, and you know, we decided that you know, this might be a business that has you know, greater value in a larger platform and could be a catalyst for consolidation and really help transform other, other studio businesses. So it has nothing to do with the business itself. We, we love Jim. We love what all three media does. Um, it's not quite as strategic to us as it might be to Warner Brothers Discovery, but they're in their own situation, as you, you well know. So. Um, it's bittersweet. Uh, let's see what happens. You know, we, we don't know exactly what will happen if we ended up continuing to own it. That would be fine with me as well. But I think it's an interesting time for all three media also to find an opportunity to scale up itself because it, ha you know, the management team there, the assets, the studios they have are world class. Um, and in terms of the interest we're getting, we're not the only ones who think that. So, okay. Yeah. So you don't have to name names, but what sort of level of interest do you think? Well, we just started the process, uh, and pretty much everybody you could think of is interested. Yeah. Even that company here, ITV, what are they? <laughs> yeah. um, when you look at, across your business and your interest in, in telco and TV, how important is TV still to the company? And that's yeah, something that we were question. talking about a lot at lunch today. Yeah, great question. Um, so if you look at Virgin Media O2, I think video represents... 15% of our 11 billion of revenue, plus or minus. Uh, so it's not as big as it used to be. When I got in the business, it was all about video. Uh, it was 100% of our revenue. Um, and today it's very much, it's 50% of our revenue in this country is mobile. And you've got broadband and enterprise. So it's a smaller and smaller piece, but it's an important piece. Because you know, we know that if we didn't provide a video service, 40% of our you know, customers would leave us because that broadband and video connection is really powerful. That bundle is really powerful for a lot of homes and consumers. 
Uh, and what we're providing today is, like everybody in the audience who's in our business, we're evolving our video service. So this TV stream product that we've launched, it's you know this big, 35 pounds, no monthly charge. If you take our broadband, we'll give you this. I have eight of them in my house. If you take our broadband, we'll give you this small device for 35 pounds. We won't charge you anything ever again. And by the way, all the apps you choose on that device, we'll give you a 10% discount on the monthly charge. Um, and it's an app-centric, beautiful user interface. It's making you know, smart TVs brilliant. It has all the live TV channels that Freely is going to launch for free. It has access to video and, and content from Virgin if you want to buy it, and every app under the sun. That's the future of video. You've been talking about that for a couple days. And so that, for us, is the video business. Uh, we're just in it in a slightly different way than we were in the past. Let's take a step back and look at what's happening in, in the global media industry, because it's really quite an extraordinary time. It feels like the yeah. tectonic plates are shifting. If we start with the writers and actor strike, which has been dragging on for months now, where do you see that ending, and, and how do you see the dust settling on it? Yeah, it's a tricky, tricky question. Um, for starters, I think, look, as I understand it, the writers and the actors are asking for all the normal things. You know, they want more, understandably, more compensation, better services, better benefits. These are fair and reasonable requests. Uh, but there's two issues that are at the forefront, streaming and AI. And in streaming, because this is an inflection point that's unusual for everybody, if you're a writer or an actor, you want to see your films on the screen, you want to know what people are thinking, you want to have impact on society, difficult to do that if it's on a streaming platform and you don't really know what happened. So that, that transparency, I think, is critical for the creative industry. Um, and then AI, there's a lot of fear of the unknown. I'm not sure it's the best time to negotiate this because in a few years when it comes back up, you might know a lot more about AI, but it's understandable. I mean, it's under if, you're, if you're in the creative industries, you are, and all you know is what you're reading and or experiencing with ChatGPT4 or whatever, it's frightening. It's scary stuff. So how would that be sorted out? You know, the writers want basically that no AI developed content can be utilized, no rewrites. Um, and actors don't want their digital images used by anybody. Um, so it's really a, it, it's a tricky conversation. Probably not the best time to negotiate it, but maybe their view is we'll, we'll start here. And in three years, when this starts to settle out and we can talk about what that might look like, then they'll take it to another level. I hope we'll get on to AI shortly, but just sticking yeah. with, with what's going on on the global media landscape. In terms of, of the relationship between the distributors yes. and the content producers, we've just seen the battle between Charter and Disney, for right. example. Where do you see that landing? Who's got the power there? Yeah, in full disclosure, uh, my chairman is the largest shareholder in Charter. <laughs> but uh, listen, it has always been an uneasy partnership, let's be honest. In the, in, you know, the deal was always that distributors built networks to millions of homes. We provided your content that, and shared revenue with you. And that was the deal. And it worked for a long time. And then the internet changed everything because people found out they could get content without normal networks. They found, and content distributors found new ways to get to consumers directly. And the truth is, I think, while it was an uneasy partnership, content wanted an open marriage. That's how I see it. Their view was, we want our cake and we want to eat it too. We want to be continued to be paid by you in this traditional way where we take rate increases all the time. But we also want to take our best content and put it on our streaming platforms because we see the future. That's a difficult position. And I think you know, it was inevitable that Charter and Disney would have this conflict. The challenge for Charter was, two virtuous you know, uh, or sort of negative cycles. On one hand, uh, as cable was losing customers, um, the, the, the content providers were losing money, and they would raise their rates, and then cable would pass that on to customers, and they would lose more customers in the content. It, so that circle doesn't work. And then content was understandably taking uh, the best stuff and putting it on streaming, and so they were e losing even more customers. So I think the resolution's a win-win. I'm, I'm not sure it's news here, anybody cares, but. Basically, Charter, which is the second largest cable operator in America, gets to provide Disney Plus in the bundle. So rather than having their customers feeling like that they have to go another way to get Disney Plus, they can get it right inside the bundle that Charter provides. Uh, they'll have the right to put ESPN on in a direct-to-consumer uh, platform with no additional fees. Um, and they got to drop a bunch of Disney channels and pay less. And Disney got to, that what they wanted, which is to keep the old model in place for a period of time. And they've done that, still getting probably two billion a year in, in, in traditional linear fees. Um, and they got a, a, an access point for greater Disney Plus growth. So it's a win-win. It might be the way of the future. Steven's here, we can talk about it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a win-win. And it's, it's, it was, it, 
you know, frightening for a lot of people when it was happening, but it worked out well, I think, for both parties. It's interesting you bill it as a win-win, because that seems to me like a bit more of an uneasy truce. They've worked out something for now. Well, but... that sounds like a win-win to me. An uneasy truce is a win-win, because it could have gone either way. <laughs> <laughs> if you were Bob Iger now, running one of the big content providers, yeah. what would your strategy be? Oh, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, Look, at Disney is a great company. You just read today or yesterday, they're going to put $60 billion into their theme parks, generating massive revenue. It's an iconic company. Uh, that is, of all the content companies on the planet, is navigating this transition real time because they are heavily dependent on the old distribution, you know, linear TV model with ESPN and all their networks. And yet with Charter and, and their Disney Plus platform, they're navigating this transition as, as well as anybody. So um, I'm not sure I'd do anything different. He's a very talented executive. He's not gonna, doesn't need advice from me. And he knows the issues as well as anybody. So, uh, but I think, you know, what Warner Brothers is doing, what, what Disney's doing is, um, you know, there was a, a uh, sort of an arms race in content, right? I mean, even today, I think the big US guys are making maybe 125 billion of content every year. That's a big number. And I think what people are doing is saying, let's be sure we're, we have economic models to support that 125 billion. Whether that means sharing content or licensing it or putting it into theaters. So everybody's rethinking the revenue model, which is the right thing to do. I think they're still gonna make great content. I don't see that changing. Which brings us to the theme of today, too uh, much to watch. You were commenting on how scary the letters looked. Kind it's of frightening. Squashed. It's frightening, <laughs> yeah. It would, it would scare my three and a half year old. Um, I, I, listen, I'm not sure there's too much to watch. This is a golden age of television. I mean, raise your hand if you're watching more video this year than you did three years ago. Everybody is. You're, the shows are fantastic. The content is world class. Um, the problem is it's too hard to find. So I don't think there's too much to watch. It's too hard to find and it's getting too expensive. In the US, if you bought all the streaming services, you were paying almost 90 bucks a month. That's not, it's a lot of money. It's bigger than the cable bill or it's about the cable bill. So it's a little expensive and it's too hard to find. And so what we're and others, and Sky and others are trying to do is create seamless navigation, voice controlled search, metadata. So if you want to watch something from Netflix or you want to watch a show, you don't have to Google which network is it on. You just ask for it and it pops up. That will make this a lot easier. So I think too much to watch is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to incredible content that's too hard to find. And, and you know, we need our job, and, and I think our job, is to help you find it, make it easier to find, easier to consume, uh, and that's what we're focused on. Well, it's a good point looking at what the consumers want, because we've been talking about this from a very business yes. perspective. Yes. What do you think they will see in, in five, ten years' time? How are things going to change? Well, there's a lot of dynamics there. I think... Um, more, I think consumers want more. They want more content, they want you know, more virtual reality, they, they, they want more um, interactivity, they want more connectivity, I think it's more. Which is a good place for all of us to be because I don't think it's a, it's a product and an industry and an ecosystem that every year consumes more. You can't say that about every industry. Um, and so I think that's a big positive. I think social media, which is gonna state the obvious almost, you know, TikTok, YouTube, these platforms you know, will be disruptive. Maybe, maybe negatively, maybe positively, depending on where you are. I mean, TikTok, you know, whether it's e-commerce or search or video or advertising, th this platform is really just getting started, I think. And um, uh, I think YouTube has two billion global viewers, two billion global viewers. I mean, it's, it's now in the US, they've got all the NFL football rights. I mean, it's just a matter of time. Uh, and you see what big tech is doing, and, and you would do it if you ran these companies. You know, um, Amazon buys MGM and is doing a bunch of sports deals. Apple is making great content, creating you know VR headsets. Um, everybody's blending into the other person's business because there's because there's opportunity and there's demand. So um, I, I think it's an exciting time to be in any aspect of this business. There's lots to be worried about. We can talk about that, but I think it's an exciting time to be in this in this ecosystem. I'm glad you brought up deals, because when I was prepping for the session, everybody said to a person, Mike is the quintessential deal maker ah. in an industry that is okay. built on deal making. Yeah. When you are wheeling and dealing, for want of a better word, um, are you thinking of placing bets at the moment on content, or are you really focusing, skewing more towards the infrastructure side of the business? I think we know what we do well. Um, you know, and, and there are a lot of great 
companies and people in this audience who make great content. I don't, um, I'm not sure that's in our DNA to compete in that space. Uh, what we're investing in is, of course, these fixed mobile champions. So we think Virgin Media O2 is the, the national champion here. I mean, we're gonna give BT a run like you've never seen. We're, we, we reach 16 million homes, there'll be fiber shortly, we'll reach another five to six million. We'll have 80% of the country fiber, 5G, um, you know, with a thriving mobile and broadband business. That connectivity side is critical for us. And also making it easier for us to sell new products and services to that customer base. So that's the core business. And to do that, we need great content. We need great content partners. In some countries, we have sports channels and some exclusive content. For the most part, we're not uh, pretending to be in that space. We're, we're distributing that content. The other things we're excited about are our infrastructure. I mean, data centers. One thing, we had an entire day on AI yesterday. I won't, I won't yeah. spill the beans. But uh, data centers, boring for this crowd. What the heck are those? Well, it, basically, everything you're doing on the internet resides somewhere in the cloud. And that cloud isn't in the sky, it's in a building the size of this on thousands of computers, hundreds of computers or servers. And, but that business is booming. I mean, infrastructure is on fire because whether it's AI or the metaverse or streaming, the amount of data moving around this country is growing, not exponentially, but 20, 30% a year. And so there's some exciting things there. We're also heavily invested, or starting to be invested in things like AI. We have a investment in a company called Metaphysic, which is presenting here. This is a company behind the Tom Cruise deep fake and the ABBA concert, if any of you saw that. We did a conference here with my management team and I'm standing on stage and behind me I'm on the screen and while I'm on stage live, they put a different face on me. That's moving while I'm talking. It's pretty crazy stuff. Um, so we're investing in the ecosystem as well. We have a, about a $3 billion venture portfolio that's putting money into these new and exciting opportunities. If we move on to AI then, yeah. and you had your AI day yesterday, how's Liberty Global, as, as a business yourselves, before we talk about your investments, using it yeah. or, or looking at it? I have to tell you, uh, I, will, I will be maybe the 100th person at this conference to tell you this is not hype, this is real. Um, everybody we met with yesterday, Microsoft, OpenAI, NVIDIA said the same thing, this is, will be bigger than the internet in 10 years time, we will look back and it will be more transformational than the internet has been uh, uh, you know, over our last 30 years or 25 years. Um, and it's, you know, your question people should ask is like, why all of a sudden? I mean, I read a stat, AI was mentioned 7,500 times by CEOs of the Fortune 500 or S&P 500 on their last earnings call. A year ago, not at all. How, how, how in one year? Can this happen? And it's because chat, I'm gonna steal this from the guy at NVIDIA, chat GPT was an iPhone moment. You know, all of a sudden we could each get on and talk to this model, these massive models, and get information back and 100 million users in two months. I mean, that's gotten everybody focused on what's been happening behind the scenes. If Google or Sam Altman were sitting here, they'd say, we've been working on this forever. We just weren't ready to bring it out. So that's point one. I'd say point two is um, for industry, for everybody here, any industry, it is gonna have meaningful impact. Anything that's customer facing, you're gonna do a better job of. Anything that's network based, you're gonna have a, you're gonna manage that network more efficiently with less energy. Um, any process, any workflow is gonna happen more productively, more, more, more economically. We just, we're just um, demoing Copilot. Anybody use Outlook out there? A couple people still left. Um, <laughs> that Outlook has a, new, uh, Microsoft has a new AI based uh, thing called Copilot. And they demoed it yesterday. Among other things, if you show up late to a team's call and you ask it to summarize what has been discussed and by who and what decisions have been made, it will take that transcript and immediately give you a summary of what everybody's been talking about. Uh, it, is, it, it can go through your emails and answer your emails. So I think it's incredible what's, what's happening and, and uh, I'm personally very excited about it. I worry about the same things you all worry about but I'm pretty excited. It is exciting, but it seems to me chief execs at the moment is kind of scrabbling to know really what to do with it. Yes, you can say, all, you know, it has yeah. potential to make your business more efficient and to yeah. do customer service, but, but right now, are you actually starting to use yes. it? Yes. Well, we've all, look at anyone here who runs uh, a business like ours is already using it in some way, shape or form. Algorithms sit behind everything, right? These are in a way 
you know, a form of artificial intelligence, things that allow you to predict what you want to watch, what, what, you, what the next reel should look like, uh, whether we should send you to you or to me at the call center because I like this, you like that. This is happening today. Rudimentary AI is in our businesses already. Now we want to amp it up, and the model is learning at a pace. I know that sounds kind of creepy, but the models are, are, are learning at a pace that is, is exponential. And so you can't wait too long. I mean, things are happening really quickly, and everybody I think here is you know, curious about it, number one, but should also be engaging in it. AT&T said the other day they want 90% of their, all 90,000 of their employees to utilize AI by the end of this year in some way, shape, or form, all 90,000. That's change management, right? That's getting people to wake up. This is happening. Um, and you know, having them engage in it personally is the best way to do it. I'm reading the runes. Where do you think the biggest impact's gonna be in the industry? I think most, you know, what, what McKinsey will tell you, four trillion of value to the global economy in customer-facing businesses and services. Um, any kind of workflow, anything that requires um, you know, processing of accounts or sales numbers, any of these types of things. Um, networks for sure, even the creative industries. I mean, I know it's scary, how could that be? But we were talking before, WPP is using this to create ad you know, plans, images, copy. I mean, I think there's, uh, that's probably frightening to say in this audience, and, and it is a bit. But there are ways to, I think the big question is, is it human augmentation or replacement? And I think what anyone who will tell you, not anyone, most people will tell you, this is about augmenting human intelligence, human consciousness. This is not about replacing us. I sound like I'm too optimistic perhaps, but I think in this moment, this is about augmenting and automating things that we already do ourselves and do well. Now, as well as the infrastructure that you talked about, the boring but important data centers, um, with your war chest, with your venture arm at Liberty Global, where are you placing bets at the moment? Where are you making investments? Where do you see opportunity? Yeah, well, in this country, you know, Virgin Media O2 just acquired one of the alternative network operators. Mm -hmm. uh, this country, I think, you know, we didn't talk about it, but uh, needs, there's probably some market repair that has to happen. You know, the, Vir the Vodafone 3 deal needs to get, I think should be approved. I think there's too many people building fiber. So, you know, in this country, there are, you have four choices for, for mobile phone operators, but I think 15 people are selling mobile. There's five core network provi uh, broadband providers you know, but there are dozens of resellers. So the choice in this country is very good, and prices are very low. I mean, the average, you know, for 35 pounds, you're getting what would cost 100, 150 in America. You know, for 20 pounds on the average mobile bill, it would be 50 to 75 in America. So it's a pretty good deal, it's, and it's a competitive market. Some repair would be good, so I think through Virgin Media O2, we're gonna look at that. Mm -hmm. How can we, you know, help repair perhaps some, some of those elements? Um, outside of that, as I mentioned, Certainly, the uh, AI space is exciting for us. We're putting money into um, you know, tech stuff. And we have the, our content investments in Formula E, ITV, all three media. Uh, we own a piece of a company called Televisa Univision which in, in, in the state. So I think you're going to see us focus on those core verticals, infrastructure, content, and tech outside and, of that. And what sort of tech businesses are you looking at? We're in companies that are developing services, products, software that we can be a customer of. So cloud-based, cybersecurity, boring stuff for this audience, but stuff that end AI-based systems. So things that we can be a customer of. So we're not just benefiting from AI, but we want to own a piece of it. Um, so there's a handful of companies we've already invested in in that space. And what's the most exciting use of AI that you've seen so far? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, because a lot of the things we're focused on are pretty boring. Uh, but I think the most exciting, look, at, I'm sure Sky's done the same thing. We've already created, using ChatGPT for a, 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 a demo around conversation with customers. Um, and and the, the demo actually knows, uh, you know, who you are, what, where you live, the, 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 the bot knows where you live and has the exact information it needs to make the best offer to you, have a conversation. That's not exciting, that's boring. But let me come up with a better one. Um, well, I thought Metaphysic was pretty cool. Have they spoken already? Wait till you see. Yeah. That's pretty cool stuff. I don't know what he's gonna show tomorrow, um, but that's interesting. And for this, in, for this industry, a, a unique, I think, platform to understand better. Well, I'm very glad you were here in person today. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks for having Mike me. From Liberty Good Global. to see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.